So pulmonary hypertension and mitral valve intervention, uh, when is the right time to intervene? Pulmonary hypertension is very common as we all face in patients that are referred for mitral valve surgery, for mitral regurgitation. And although it is generally recognized that presence of pH has a negative impact on operative outcome, available data is amazingly scant. And a few recent studies have aimed to address some of the critical questions, such as what is the incidence of pulmonary hypertension? And I've listed some incidents that has been published to date. As you can see, it's a very wide range, uh, mainly because of different uh, techniques to determine the pulmonary, pulmonary pressures and also the heterogeneity of the populations that studied. So the reality is we really don't know what the incidence is. There's some other really critical questions that are left unanswered in asymptomatic patients with severe MR. What, uh, uh, systolic pressure should trigger referral, and what is the impact of pulmonary hypertension and outcome, both postoperatively and in long term of the patient. And as we all know, um, the, the latest uh, ACCA HA guidelines have dealt with this in stating that um, much of our repair is reasonable for asymptomatic patients with chronic severe non-rheumatic primary MR and preserved LV function in whom there's a high likelihood of a successful durable repair with a new onset of AFib or resting pulmonary hypertension, in which they define as PA pressure of greater than 50. But this got a 2A uh, uh, recommendation and a level of B indication, again, due to lack of really uh, well done uh, randomized clinical trials. Across the pond, in uh, European guidelines in 2012, uh, they have stated the same iteration, except for them, uh, they gave it a level of recommendation of C, of expert opinion, and uh, stating that um, you can also uh, uh, institute a um, exercise portion of pulmonary hypertension with uh, systolic pressure greater than 60 to be a uh, indicator for possibly considering a much valve intervention, again, based on expert opinions. Uh, looking at all the data that has been uh, focusing on pulmonary hypertension and MR, um, one of the uh, original ones that were done that looked at this in focus was the uh, multi-center long-term intervention study, the MITRE registry. Uh, this is from uh, four centers, uh, four in Europe and one in US out of Mayo. Um, from 87 to 2004, they enrolled 437 patients where they, again, uh, um, define pulmonary hypertension as greater than 50, which was in 23% of the patients. And you can see the uh, overall survival curve on the right, and what they've determined that the independent predictors of pulmonary hypertension were age and left atrial size, and there was a strong independent predictor of death, uh, cardiovascular death, and heart failure with pulmonary hypertension. And mitral valve surgery at any time during the follow-up, during this cohort, was beneficial to the patients, and however, um, uh, pulmonary hypertension was associated with increased risk of postoperative death. Probably one of the uh, more uh, robust data-driven study that was done came out of the University of Maryland. Uh, I had a pleasure of partaking on the study uh, with uh, Dr. James Gammy um, at this time period. And this was a retrospective study from 2002 to 2010. About 873 patients were included. And the definition was uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension were divided into four different stages, from none to mild, moderate, and severe, as with the uh, systolic pressures, as you can see defined up there. And this, this cohort, as you can see, is not that atypical of patients that are referred for mitral valve surgery. Um, age about 60, uh, neurocardiac association function of class three or four, in majority of them. Um, uh, about a third of them had prior cardiac surgery. Um, a lot of them have hypertension, diabetes, and other cohorts. You can see that their LV function is mainly uh, preserved. And that um, for this cohort at the University of Maryland, uh, we, uh, uh, they were able to get data from about half of them from ECHO and half from right heart catheterization. About 15% had right heart dysfunction. Unfortunately, that number is not reliable per se because that is taken from a very uh, um, uh, subjective data. And for our MR grade, about 24% were moderate to severe and uh, more than half were severe. And this, go, this kind of gives you the uh, overall picture of the baseline characteristics according to the degree of pulmonary hypertension from none to mild, moderate to severe. And in a gestalt, uh, pulmonary hypertension was 
present in about more than half the patients. It was severe in 17%. And higher pre op like pressures were associated with increasing age, female gender, um, high functional class, greater prevalence of comorbidity, and it was also associated with decrease in function, greater degree of left atrial enlargement, of course, more atrial fibrillation, and greater degree of RV dysfunction. How about operative outcome? Uh, you can see that the, for, with patients with no pulmonary hypertension, it was a really excellent result of operative mortality of 2%. With mild, still acceptable, about 3%. From moderate to severe, there was a, a, a definitely a higher level of uh, uh, mortality with 8% and 12%. And by multivariate analysis, there was a definite uh, association, association between outcome and pulmonary pulmonary pressures. If you look at the aggregate between the uh, patients with no pulmonary hypertension and, and everybody who had pulmonary hypertension, you can see that the, uh, there was a significant correlation, and the divergence starts very early upon surgery. And you can see that the numbers, again, tell the story where at one year it's 96% to 83% versus uh, five years is 86% to 67%. And how about long-term survival when you look at the, the different cohorts of four subsets? Uh, again, every single subset from none, mild, moderate to severe, uh, there's a definite difference in the um, uh, uh, survivability of long-term between patients having uh, no pulmonary hypertension and, and the degree of pulmonary hypertension upon at the time of surgery. Now, I think one thing that this uh, study really did bring to highlight is the group uh, with no pulmonary hypertension and mild pulmonary hypertension. And, and when you look at this cohort a little bit uh, closely, uh, what, what they have uh, reported is that uh, although the operative mortality is similar, uh, the baseline characteristics uh, do differ in that even patients that have mild pulmonary hypertension have lower EF, more episodes of AFib, and more TR. Postoperative outcome was also affected with prolonged ventilation, uh, longer hospital stay, and ICU stay. And there was a long-term survival change where a, even a mild uh, increase in uh, pre like pressure compromised long-term survival. Now, the question is, if you do the surgery, do, uh, do the pulmonary pressures ever go back? And the answer is really no. You can see on the left-hand panel there, uh, there's a preoperative uh, pulmonary pressures and pre-discharge with a significant decrease. But after that, there's really no um, uh, uh, further change that is meaningful. And, and, and unless you enter the surgery with, with a normal PA pressure, a likelihood is you'll probably never get to normalcy. So it, this kind of um, illustrates the fact that incomplete improvement uh, suggests that the changes that one sees with much regurgitation on a chronic basis on the pulmonary vasculature and remodeling really starts early. And even though you have uh, uh, removed the nidus, the much regurgitation, the, the remodeled pulmonary vasculature really never goes uh, to back to totally being normal. So this brings us to the current sta status of pulmonary hypertension and the much regurgitation, the part about go and wait. Now, one uh, important aspect, I think, is a diagnostic consideration. Uh, stress testing, I think, has to be utilized uh, pro prospectively and thoughtfully to capture the patients really, who may not be symptomatic at rest, but who really do have symptoms with exercise. And of course, the question of is echocardiogram, the, something that we all rely on, really sufficient to diagnose for the presence of pulmonary hypertension? Uh, in the uh, University of Maryland cohort, 15% of the patients did not have, a, have an uh, TR envelope to estimate the pulmonary pressures. And so should right heart cath be done in all the patients that are considered for any kind of mitral valve intervention? This will give you the full hemodynamics. And you can also obtain other uh, hemodynamic markers that will tell you a little bit more about the status of the pulmonary vasculature, such as the DPG and PVR. Now, this is from the World Health Symposium on Pulmonary Hypertension, where there was a really uh, a focus on left heart disease and pH because this covers such a huge spectrum of patients where we have such uh, uh, little guidance and even small, even still a uh, smaller amount of therapy. So the, for a desirable trait for hemodynamic marker, it was agreed upon that you wanted to reflect changes on the pulmonary circulation you want it to be a clear marker of the pulmonary vasculopathy and be as least dependable on the changes on the wedge pressure and the stroke volume. And it should reflect the changes on the compliance and other components of the pulmonary ar arterial system, such as distensibility. And taking all of this in aggregate, it was felt that the diastolic pulmonary pressure was uh, probably one of the better candidates 
to represent what is going on in the pulmonary vasculature. And I've listed the normal values there with a one and two being normal. And um, uh, for heart failure, greater than or equal to seven being felt to be a prognostic marker. And in a precapillary or PAH situation, um, uh, that it should be greater than 10. So based on this, the committee felt that it was, uh, it we had enough data to state that um, uh, um, uh, for wedge pressure greater than 15 and for DPG greater than or equal to 7 should uh, uh, encompass the uh, CPC pH or the uh, out of proportion cohort. But recently, the uh, European guideline have modified this a little bit uh, based on some of the other literature that has come out stating that uh, diastolic uh, pulmonary gradient may not be sufficient to capture the full breadth of the complexity on the pulmonary hypertension and left heart disease. And what they are also recommending is uh, including a P as well. By following the literature, you will see that most often uh, uh, people are incorporating uh, DPG, PVR, and transpulmonary gradient all together to really get a full scope of uh, the status of the reversibility or irrevers irreversibility of the pulmonary vasculature. I just want to uh, cover the study that uh, this whole recommendation was based on. And this is uh, from Vienna, where about 3,000 patients underwent a right and left heart catheterization. And they uh, uh, looked at the uh, survival and outcome of patients that indeed had transpulmonary greater than, greater than 12 and DPG greater than 7. And to uh, um, outlining, the, outlining that, um, those who had Oh, those who had uh, no pulmonary hypertension uh, versus passive congestion, this is the out of proportion pulmonary hypertension, and this is a precapillary pulmonary hypertension or the pulmonary arterial hypertension where all of the pulmonary vasodilators are used. And you can see by a very striking difference in the outcome. And they had a, a small sample of patients where they had um, uh, histologic samples, and you can see that this this is uh, uh, showing the changes in the pulmonary hypertension and left heart disease, where you have a very high trans uh, pulmonary gradient and and uh, trans uh, and also DPG as well. And this is showing the changes on pulmonary arterial hypertension, where you have patients with group one PAH with enormously high uh, 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 PA pressure. And, and demonstrating the fact that there's a very uh, much of a similarity between uh, those two histologically. So this is where um, all the, uh, the interest in incorporating the diastolic pulmonary gradient came to be in the left heart disease uh, um, uh, algorithm. But if you looking at mitral regurgitation, as we all know, um, the, the trouble uh, begins with just chronic venous congestion that, for, that offsets the alveolar capillary uh, plexiform and stress failure. Um, this, in an acute setting, of course, reverses. But in a chronic setting over many, many years, um, it does induce increase in pulmonary pressures that, that uh, offsets structural changes, but also it, uh, um, functional changes as well in the endothelium, where where you have now imbalance of the mediators, such as the nitric oxide and the endothelin, where it offsets and propagates further remodeling of the, uh, the pulmonary vascular tree. So on one hand, what we would like to have is a situation where we can recognize the uh, um, much regurgitation early uh, and be very proactive about uh, referring to surgery so that you do not undergo the changes and, and what you have just just a simple pony venous hypertension and, and, um, and, and intervene before you have the combined pre and post capillary uh, pulmonary hypertension. So in the current status, as we know, the systolic pulmonary pressure greater than 50 is a class 2 indication. Um, and the impact on the surgery, as has also been shown, is that patients with higher PAP really uh, more commonly require more concomitant procedures. And the much valve repair is less uh, commonly done in those patients. So with a significant impact on mild pulmonary hypertension in the post-op morbidity and a long-term outcome, should refer for much regurgitation surgery be triggered before the systolic pressure reaches 50 millimeters of mercury. And to look at this in a, in a back-end way, uh, this is a, a review and meta-analysis that, that, that has been done on all um, three studies that specifically looked at the, uh, the patients that were looked at for early surgical intervention or watchful waiting. And what the, what the um, uh, analysis reporting is that in this three pooled analysis, in asymptomatic patients without class one triggers or symptoms, um, the survival benefit uh, persists in a, a 
in a subgroup analysis in patients even without any class two triggers or of atrial fibrillation or pulmonary hypertension. And you can see that all the patients uh, who were studied uh, really did better with surgery than a watchful, watchful waiting period. And that even included without having atrial fibrillation or pulmonary hypertension. So the authors here conclude that early surgery may also benefit when, in, uh, when uh, prior to the development of class two triggers. So the, the, the last question is, is it ever too late? And when is it, and is it ever too late? And, and uh, this question was recently um, um, uh, presented and actually uh, looked at by a group uh, out in a Northwest uh, Hospital up in Chicago, where there was a contemporary analysis of pulmonary hypertension in patients undergoing mitral valve surgery was looked at. Is this a risk factor? And this was followed by an interesting uh, commentary, um, is pulmonary hypertension in valve disease, is it a beast of the past? And with a century message uh, 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 stating that severe pH used to be, used to be an important risk factor after surgery um, of the mitral valve, and this may no longer be the case. Well, this uh, study looked at a large group of patients, over 1,500, uh, that were undergoing mitral valve surgery from 2004 to 2013, and they stratified the pulmonary hypertension into four categories again, with none uh, being less than 35, moderate, severe, and, and, and included a, a group of extreme, uh, greater than or equal to 80 millimeters of mercury. And then they used a propensity score matching, uh, which resulted in a total of 430 patients by pulmonary hypertension groups. And, and in this cohort, about 68 patients had pulmonary hypertension defined as, you, as shown here. And then the, um, the outcome demonstrated that uh, uh, there was a significant difference in the outcome um, out of all the four groups on pulmonary hypertension. And the characteristics of patients with pH were they were older, more comorbidities, and the surgery uh, uh, demonstrating that you need a longer perfusion cross clamp time, uh, more uh, concomitant procedures, and the mitral valve repair rates were higher among those who did not have pulmonary hypertension. And if you look at the 30-day and the five-year mortality, um, if you just look at the, uh, the straight analysis alone, there is a, a significant difference between those that have pulmonary hypertension versus none. But by the propensity-matched cohort for the severe group, um, there really was no difference between the two. There was for extreme pulmonary hypertension, those that had systolic PA pressure greater than 80. But again, for the severe group, there really was none that was shown in the propensity cohort. Thus, the, the reason why the, the commentator was made about uh, perhaps uh, uh, this group, really the, the risk was not that great. Now, the features of this paper included that um, uh, they did identify pulmonary pressures at a little bit lower setting. Uh, they, were, they did differentiate between the severe and extreme, a severely, severely high pH. And uh, the cohort also included some patients with mitral stenosis. So it's a little bit different. And the propensity matching done for 215 patients uh, uh, with and without pulmonary hypertension, um, again, with, uh, without propensity matching, there was a significant difference in the operative mortality that was three times higher uh, without pulmonary hypertension. And of course, with propensity matching, that uh, difference really did go away. So I think that uh, there was a lot of uh, good discussion at the end of this uh, um, article, uh, really kind of giving the pros and cons of the different ways of looking at the analysis. So some of the concluding thoughts, um, asymptomatic, uh, a severe pulmonary MR, it is a risk factor. Uh, most optimal uh, systolic pressure, I don't think it's really clear at this time point. Uh, 50 is recommended in the guidelines. Um, some studies are, are using lower cutoffs. Earlier intervention shows improved long-term outcome, but less post-op mor morbidity and de decreased length of stay. Um, severe pulmonary hypertension is reported not to be a risk factor in one study that I've just shared with you, but I think this needs to be further evaluated. And importance of referring to a heart therapy center of excellence, this is a state in the guideline, and I think this is very important for the outcome of the patient. And uh, judicious post-operative management, I think this is critical in achieving the optimal outcome in targeting RV support. And interestingly, none of the uh, studies that were uh, published really targeted or even mentioned um, their post-op management uh, uh, algorithm. And the long-term follow-up for pulmonary hypertension and possible treatment with pulmonary vasodilators uh, really need to be evaluated and recommended. Thank you for your attention.